Kennedy's my name. Mr. Hardy's mine. This is Mr. Laurel, Mr. Kennedy. How do you do, Mr. Laurel? <laughs> And welcome to this special edition of the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast. I'm Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy Blog, and your host for the next hour or so. Today's show is somewhat unusual in as much as we're not focusing on a particular film this time, as we usually do. Instead, this episode is going to focus on a particular person. Now, you may recall on the last show, Nico Kardenstadt and I discussed the boys' silent short, Leave Them Laughing. On the next episode, episode 15, the film in focus will be The Finishing Touch. And so today is a sort of a bridge between those two films, where we are going to take a closer look at a man who appeared in both of these pictures. And I'm talking, of course, about the wonderful Edgar Kennedy. Edgar Kennedy is associated with about 11 comedies with Stan and Babe, filling the void left by Jimmy Finlayson, who'd gone looking for lead roles at other studios for a while. So Leave Him Laughing was Edgar's introduction to the Laurel and Hardy world, and he certainly hit the ground running. So, to find out more, I made a call to the person best placed to discuss Uncle Ed, or Kennedy the Cop, his biographer, author of Edgar Kennedy, Master of the Slow Burn, Bill Cassara. So we'll be crossing over to California in a moment or two just to chat with Bill, so stay tuned for that. But before we do that, I just wanted to say a huge thank you for all the great comments and tweets that you've been sending me over this last month. In particular, thanks to Tigrig, who left me a great review on Apple Podcasts. Tigrig wrote, Best podcast ever. This podcast is a must, certainly for fans of the boys, but also for anybody with an interest in film history, social history, etc. Patrick has a very engaging style and clearly loves his subject. He really gets the best out of his guests who clearly share his passion. I really look forward to the monthly episodes and looking forward to the journey all the way to Atoll K. Keep up the great work, Patrick. Thank you very much for that, Tigrig. Um, and also thanks to Leon, the old musician, who left this review on Podbay. And Leon says, What a great podcast! I've been a fan of Laurel and Hardy since the late 60s, and I was so happy to find this blogcast, and of course the blog of which I am a faithful reader. Patrick does a marvellous job as an interviewer, and he and his guests present a wealth of information about the boys. I especially like the format, where each episode is devoted to one or two of the films. I realise it will take a long time to get through them all, but this allows me to savour each film as it is discussed, and I look forward to hearing what Patrick and his guests think about my favourite Laurel and Hardy films. Leon, thank you so much. Brilliant comments. Uh, I really do love to receive your comments and feedback, so please do keep them coming. Uh, now, in other news, a few days ago, I published my latest blog on the Laurel and Hardy blog website. Um, as you probably know by now, these podcasts basically follow the same chronology as the written blogs. So whereas on the podcast, we've reached 1928's Leave Em Laughing, the blog is actually a bit further ahead, having just entered 1932 and covering the boys' masterpiece, The Music Box. So you can read that by clicking the blog icon at www.blog-heads.com blogheads.com or by clicking the link in the show notes over on facebook it's been great to see a number of tent meetings finally starting to get back underway once again so if your tent is getting ready to meet and if you fancy a new laurel and hardy t-shirt to go in don't forget our range of blogheads t-shirts are available on our redbubble store there's about 13 different designs with more on the way um, and you can choose your own style of shirt and also the color too you can also pick up matching phone cases, notebooks, travel mugs, and tons of other items. To look at the full range, again, just go to www.blogheads.com. That's blog-heads.com. And click on the t-shirt icon that drops down on the top of the page. Either that, or you can just follow the link in the show notes. It's probably easier. Um, every purchase, of course, supports this podcast and helps to keep it going and makes you look really cool as well. And if you have bought something from the site, then please do send me a photo. I'd love to see it and share it on the Laurel and Hardy blog page. And that's about it for our little preamble. Um, let's now hop over to California on today's guest interview. Now be as quiet as you can. I'll see you later. <laughs> Uh, 
Our special guest today is Bill Cassara. After spending 30 years of his life with the Monterey County Sheriff's Office, Bill went on to pursue his hobby of researching and writing biographies of forgotten movie comedians. Today, his books include biographies of Vernon Dent, Ted Healy and Silas Barnaby himself, Henry Brandon, but his first book, published back in 2005, focused on the life and career of one of the most popular members of the Laurel and Hardy Stock Company. The book is titled Edgar Kennedy, Master of the Slow Burn, and Kennedy the Cop is the reason he's joining us today. So I'm thrilled to say, Bill Kassara, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you, Patrick, and I'm looking forward to this. As am I, as am I. I um, I'm really interested in Edgar Kennedy. Bill, he's one of those players who... He's kind of always there, but he's he's so kind of understated. For me, he's very understated in what he does, and he's kind of like Mr. Reliable, and he's kind of flown under my radar a little bit. I've never really looked too far into him. I read your book a, a number of years ago, um, and I really enjoyed just sort of picking back up again um, over these last few weeks and just getting, getting, getting to know Edgar again. So I'm really looking forward to chatting with you, Bill, uh, about the book, why you wrote it, and, and specifically about, uh, about Mr. Kennedy. So... As I as I do with all guests on the blogcast, Bill, could you start by telling us a little bit about your Laurel and Hardy backstory? Um, you know what your earliest memories of them are and um, how you were introduced to them. Uh, good question. Uh, when Laurel and Hardy first were broadcast on commercial TV, this was back in the late fifties. I was a little boy, and my father was uh, extra excited, so I became excited. And over the and over the years, we'd watch it together. So there's it a very much of a bonding experience, and I love to hear my father laugh. I never forgot that. And uh, he used to tell me when he was a boy, he used to go to uh, the cinemas downtown San Jose and uh, watch Laurel and Hardy with his Italian-speaking grandmother who didn't understand English. So he loved to tell the story. And, uh, uh, yeah, I caught Laurel and Hardy whenever I could on TV, but it kind of disappeared. And I didn't think much about it again until college. And they showed a couple of the films. And then I bought a book by Dr. John McCabe, Mr. Laurel and Mr. Hardy. I gave it to my dad. And he, I think he flipped through it. I wound up reading it. And... <laughs> <laughs> I had a thirst for knowledge. I want no more. Yeah, brilliant. That's brilliant. That's really nice. That's exactly, I have to say, that's exactly my introduction to the boys. It was my father um, and his laughter that, that drew me yes. in. And, I, and I, for, for, for the first part, I was laughing at him, laughing at them. Exactly, yeah. And, and then one day it switched, yeah. And one day I sort of thought, what is he looking at? I remember uh, he'd be taking a nap. And if they threw a Laurel and Hardy short or movie on TV and I was happened to see it as live broadcast, I said, Dad, wake up, they're showing a Laurel and Hardy. Now, the house would be on fire <laughs> in, in other situations. He'd sleep through it. And if I said, <laughs> I said Laurel, uh, Lauren Hardy's on TV, he'd grab those glasses, come on up. So I was associated with pleasant memories. That's lovely. That's really nice. That's really nice. I think that's quite a, a common um, introduction as well. People with their parents, specifically fathers, it seems to be as well. It's yes. far, it's, it's a father thing. Seems isn't to it? be. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. It's funny. I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are mothers, but uh, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, and so, uh, moving forward in time, um, Bill, you know, how are you connected with the Laurel and Hardy world today? And, and you know, what's your sort of involvement in in that uh, in that world? Well, it, it really goes back to. When I started at Sons of the Desert Tent Midnight Patrol in Monterey, California, 1984. Now, there were steps leading up to it, but uh, uh, I had some musicians and I was interested in starting a tent. So we had a, uh, two of our other members were cops. So we had a little debate whether it's Midnight Patrol or or some music theater bugs or some other music related. Uh, the story we like to tell is uh, we took a vote and the cops won because we had guns. So that <laughs> a little. Get that gun and shoot the kill. We always tell 
something like that. And uh, so, so yeah, so you so did the the writing come before? Uh, sorry, after the Sons of the Desert Tent, Bill. Yes, yes. Um, we always had a, a banquet at the end of the year. We had tent meetings, but the banquet especially we invited special guests, and uh, so we had a running joke: Where was uh, Edgar Kennedy born? Now, I came across this question. When we started the tent, we had no idea Edgar Kennedy was associated with Monterey County at all. And uh, I found it in a Leonard Malton book, Two Reeler Comedies. And in there it said, born in Monterey County, 1890. Well, I was a, I was a deputy sheriff at that time in uh, 19... 80s, early 80s, I thought, I'm a film buff and a historian. I thought, where in Monterey County? How can you just say Monterey County is huge, just bigger than uh, the state of Rhode Island in the United States. So I put my ear out and nobody seemed to know. Hollywood people didn't know. They knew about Edgar Kennedy and the Monterey County people knew about their history, but they didn't know anything about Edgar Kennedy. So, so we had a lot of theories. What did it come in? Were they part of a show troop? So we only guessed. So we did that a few years, little updates, and they were more tongue in cheek than anything else. Until um, we found out that Edgar's daughter was still alive, and so she had never been involved with Sons of the Desert. She was raising her own family. And her dad died in 1948. So uh, this wasn't, uh, it never came to her attention before until I ran it down. And uh, we were able to connect through Tony Hawes, uh, uh, Stan Laurel's son-in-law. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So did you, I guess your your time with the police force helped you with your investigative... uh... (laughs) <laughs> it's funny how that worked. It's funny because I, I remember reading it and I said, well, where is he born? I, and instead of waiting for someone else to answer, I said, damn it, Bill, you're a cop. Find out. Investigate it. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> oh, brilliant. This is Officer Law speaking. Yeah. Uh, uh, Officer Hardy forgot the address to the last call. 24 Walnut Avenue. Just a minute till I put that down. You can go ahead now. I got it. Brilliant. You didn't turn up at her doorstep in a police car, did you? No. <laughs> that would have been a shock. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you, so, okay, so you're, uh, one of my next questions was going to be, um, you know, where did your particular interest in Edgar Kennedy come from? And is it particularly the geographical aspect of, of where did he come from in Geographical, Monterey? but I certainly knew who Edgar Kennedy was. We saw him. Yeah. In uh, some of the Senate, uh, he was an original Keystone cop. Yeah, yeah. And, and he went on, you know, once he went to Roach, he was a high pass as a, as a cop or as a heavy. And we saw him in the Our Gang comedy shorts, uh, The uh, Little Rascals, if you will. So I, I was very familiar with him, but I didn't know. I started uh, researching that he was in over 500 movies. Yes, yeah, that's incredible. That really is an incredible amount, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I think, it's, is it 11? 11 with Laurel and Hardy, I think that's all, yeah. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. And directed two of them. Mm-hmm. That's right, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so you decided to to investigate it further, and I, I remember listening to a, pod, a a previous podcast with you on Bill, and you were talking about when you got chatting with his daughter, and you were managed to get sort of her her permission, her yeah, her, her nod to do a, a book. Is that right? How this occurred was Edgar's daughter was getting up in age, and I heard from her um, offspring that she had always wanted to write a book about her dad. Now, like I said, he died in 1948. She was getting up there, and she was ready to pass the baton to someone, unbeknownst to me. But uh, she eventually said, 
Bill, you're the one. I want you to come up and look at my father's uh, photographs that we have in a cardboard box. Well, there was no commitment as yet, but once I went up there and saw the, I saw the beautiful prints, original struck from going back to the silent days. Wow. And I, I, that was worth the trip alone. And uh, I looked through there. Well, that's a good starting block. <laughs> that's a good starting block. Yeah. Yeah, there was an. If you're interested, there's another uh, key to all this. Is uh, Art Kent hosted Son of the Desert Edgar Kennedy celebration in Monterey? Once we found out exactly where it was, and we celebrated it uh, a big hotel and a big festival over the July Fourth weekend, uh, three or four days. And we had. 200 people coming from all over, including five different foreign nations. So uh, that really uh, validated it in the mind of, of uh, Colleen Edgar Kennedy's daughter. She was quite impressed. That's lovely. So, so it was that. I had the wind behind me, and Sam Lowell's daughter encouraged me. And so it just said, well, I've never written a book before. I've written articles, but never a book. Well... There it goes. Well, you're a cop. Instead of writing a report, write a book. So. <laughs> and how did you find that process, Bill? Did you enjoy the, the process? I mean, you must have done. You've gone on to write another four or so books. And I mean, how did you find it overall? What were your sort of biggest challenges writing it? Oh, that, well, there was no information in one spot. And back then, there was no internet. So started off first at, at a mutual friend who started writing down um, filmographies. And so it was all written by hand, and there's no way to uh, verify these things. But it was a good starting point. If I could get the filmography, I'd know where to go. So my objective was to find out as much as I can about anything written up about his films. And sometimes I get a little bio. I thought some of those studio bios weren't quite accurate. <laughs> that yes. was, that's like a false lead. Yeah. You get a false lead, you're going down this rabbit hole and you realize this is an ad. So you have to backtrack and, and verify from different sources. And it took me to San Francisco where they, their public library, again, this is before digital newspaper research was available. So I didn't know there was any other way. So I had to go up to those libraries and, and um, get on microfilm. And what I was really going for is his beginning of his career started in the professional boxing. Well, I'll bet you $10 to one that Muggsy Long wins. I'll take $5. Amateur and professional boxing. So I, that was my objective is to follow it chronologically so it makes sense for me. Right, right, okay. Okay, That yeah, that's good. So, yeah, that's. I mean, that brings us perfectly on to um, Edgar himself then. So can you give us like a little bit of a potted history about Edgar's um, his, his early life and his career at the Roach Studios? Well, at the Roach Studios... A lot of people, now everyone knows he started at Senate, went to Christie Educational, and he was at Paramount, he was in some features, but it was still the silent era when uh, Roach hired him. And I must specify, if Richard Jones was the, the he was the, uh, the general manager, I'm trying to think of his exact title, but that will suffice. Roach stole if Richard Jones from Senate, who had virtually the same responsibilities. So that's how Roach got one up. He hired uh, Edgar Kenny along with probably some other set guys. And so he knew of Edgar's talent. Edgar was a director and he could play just about any part. But, uh, it would fit right in with what Roach had in mind and support Laurel and Hardy. Yeah. And they invented the, 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 Edgar had played cops before, but uh, he uh, made a real delightful character, kind of an inept public officer. 
uh, which we found hysterical <laughs> to play off of uh, Laurel and Hardy. Even the kids yeah. are gang. <laughs> Poor old Kennedy. <laughs> the only way that you'll ever make an arrest is frame it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> frame it myself. <laughs> frame it myself. <laughs> Brilliant. So, was did did you say that he was also directing whilst at Senate? He he, he was he was directing through that yes, as he, well. Yes, uh, started with Senate and uh, all his stuff. But once he did reach Roach, the, the two Laurel and Hardy uh, silence was uh, your darn Putin and um, what was it? Uh, soup to nuts. Soup to nuts. Soup to nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's clear that even though he was well-rounded, he was able to bring that experience as part of his character. And and here's a little-known fact. A little, I never see it written up, maybe in the Edgar book, <laughs> is that James Finlayson, Jimmy Finn, as we know, well, he was uh, part of the rise of Laurel and Hardy, but he Finlayson was there first. For Roach yeah. before they were teamed up. Yeah. And Finn Layson thought he was being built up eventually to be a, a comedy star and supported by Laurel and Hardy and Charlie Chase and what have you. And when Hats Off became such a success, uh, Finn Layson said, Well, I can see I'm going to be squeezed a little bit. <gasps> and my career's not over. So he went to, uh, First National uh, to star. At least he thought that was going to happen. So he was gone. He was gone a year and a half. And uh, to, uh, I wouldn't say replace, but say reorganize and and Roach uh, casting, Edgar Kennedy was hired. So so that's why you don't see Finn Layson and Kennedy overlapping there's only there's only one movie that they were overlapped so that's kind of a trivia question that's i'm just trying to think which one that is i'm just trying to trying to work that out night owls night owls very good yeah. night owls <laughs> and they like, you could probably hear the cogs whirring then <laughs> and they didn't share a scene but they're in the same movie that's right that's right and a good movie it is too <laughs> it's the garbage man sir I'm over the wall. Yeah. Oh! Don't touch me. Pick those things up. So, uh, okay, so, yeah, so he arrives at, at the Roach Studios, and, I mean, Leave Him Laughing, it was his first film with the boys, but he'd, he'd done some some Roach films before that, hadn't he? This wasn't his first film with, with Roach. This was... Yes, uh, on the Roach lot, yes, he was uh, active. And... Uh, you have to prove yourself a little bit before you're going head to head with the main stars. So everyone was very comfortable with him as uh, the cop. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, by the time of leave and laughing, uh, I mean, their star was certainly ascending, but I mean, this was quite early days for Laurel and Hardy uh, as a team. Um, you know, there was only sort of three or four films behind them at that point. Um, but I, th- I really, th- I look at Leave Them Laughing as the f- kind of film that's really sort of cemented them as this is the the big driving force now. This is what we're all going to get behind because it it was just one, um, you know, fantastic film after another, and they just th- there was no sign of it flagging. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant film. What, what's your what's your um, your view on Leave Them Laughing, uh, Bill? Well, it's a it's a very important. Uh, step up in the series because it was still silent but uh their character laurel and hardy's characters were fully established by then and with uh, kennedy the cop who is a big burly irish policeman you know that just fit in you, you have uh you have your heavy and then you have the comedians feeding off i was always intrigued by by uh the laughing gas induced laughter and uh, it uh, it just broke 
any audience you show that to, they are screaming because uh, the you know, stand is just overwhelmed with laughter. We've seen him in later talkies where he does a laughing fit, but I, I always kind of wish uh, they made that a talkie because we could have heard that pure laughter. Absolutely. And it, I just, you know, I mentioned this in my blog and, and also to, to Nico um, earlier, you know, the, it was a brave choice to make a film like that in a, a silent film. Because obviously the the thing about laughter is it's contagious, and it's usually if you can hear it. Um, right. So, but it just shows you the quality of Stan and Baby to actually be able to project that through the screen just by pure you know visuals. Oh, yeah. Amazing, yeah. absolutely amazing, really really good. Um, and how do you think it stacks up against Stan, Babe, and Edgar's other films together? You know, where, where do you think it sits in amongst that uh, little canon? Oh, very highly, very very highly indeed. Uh, I could go on and name the others, but uh, they all have their high points. I love The Perfect Day, and uh, Edgar plays a different role in that. And <laughs> with that gouty foot and uh, <laughs> and uh, is this frustration. Come on, Uncle. It's hat and coat. Come on. Say, listen, I'm not going to leave this house today. Oh, but Uncle, it's such a perfectly gorgeous day for a picnic. But this gout of mine is killing me. I didn't sleep a week last night. It was palpitating so. Oh, but Uncle, I think you better come go with us. It'll be better in the sunshine. No, I got a picnic of my own right here. Oh! Mm. It's really kind of a blueprint for Edgar Kennedy, the character, and later in his career, where he played uh, something similar to that in his Average Man series. Right, right. Yeah, can you just give us a little bit? So, uh, you know, so we've we've got um, Edgar now. He's he's arrived at the Roach Studios and he's getting himself, you know, well established. Eleven films with the boys. Can you just give us a little bit about uh, about the rest of his career? You know, what else did he do at Roach? Um, and any, if you know the reasons why he left Roach, and and what what did he do from there, uh, Bill? Well, we I mentioned he did since he was a contract player. He supported all the other all the other acts that were going on, like say the Art Gang and Charlie Face and uh, Boyfriends. And uh, but something happened in uh, 1931. You know, the Depression sunk in, and loans were overdue from the banks, and uh, so they put the squeeze on uh, on monies going into the shorts. And uh, so that impacted not just uh, production value, but the salaries. Stan and Polly were getting raises consistently. And a lot of people don't know this, but Edgar Kennedy's was getting raises almost as much as Laurel and Hardy. Right, okay. Right up, right up until about 1931. So what's that efficiency expert from from the bank would come in and oversee and recommend uh, how to cut things. Stan Laurel hated his guts. Oh, we're talking about Ginsburg. Yes. Yeah. Hated him. <laughs> I'm sure all that, uh, Edgar saw the writing on the wall and uh, uh, Roach could just terminate him without any problem, without any financial backtrack. And uh, so Edgar Kennedy wants to participate further in his career, he was going to have to look elsewhere. Now, he was never fired from Roach, but an opportunity came along at RKO, and he had uh, some friends over there, and, uh, well, they needed a, a short a short unit as well, so they started it up, and uh, Edgar Kennedy was their main star. Right, Okay. Just, I've just suddenly thought about something. Just backtracking a couple of years there, when the studios made the transition to sound, wasn't that a bit of an issue for Edgar Kennedy with his voice? Uh, what we hear is got a kind of an Irish accent. I now come along, Mrs. McGillicuddy, and uh, a big barrel. But in actuality, uh, I'm told by his daughter. Of course, that was a stage voice. It is very self soft spoken at home, 
and uh, very intelligent. And she said, you had to listen to him because he was very opposite in how he uh, uh, articulated himself in movies. I mean, he made that character and he had to work with a professional voice coach. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so he hit the jackpot that, that suited him. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's what I remember reading in, in your book about uh, the transition to to sound. It really sort of shook him because he he realised that his voice was not as people would expect it to be from you know from the silent pictures. Exactly. Um, and interestingly, of course, he is in Unaccustomed as We Are, the boys' first talking picture. Uh, Mrs. Hardy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Stop that crying! Stop that crying! No, I'm going to take the boys outside and give them a good talk about it. You go out in the kitchen and fix up a nice little supper. I'll have him back here in five minutes for you. Oh, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy. That's perfectly all right, Mrs. Hart. Hey, here, here. You bulldoze, take this trunk and put it over in my apartment. <laughs> but uh, so so yeah, so we had to go and work with a voice coach to 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 bring that. Voice test. Everyone was nervous. Yeah. But um, it must have been a terrible time, wasn't it? Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, Edgar, you know, he he was a good actor, so yeah. And he didn't have a, a whole lot of dialogue to do, so he was able to uh, wade in, sort of speak. Yeah, but there was a really interesting uh, part if, uh, in your book as well about how um, how we looked on. Um, later actors who who only knew the talkies and he was sort of saying to I can't remember which particular actor he was talking about but he was saying that you don't act you call yourself an actor but you're not actually acting I think that was the the quote something like that that's really perceptive of you it's a, a little uh, point that's brought up and and uh, that caught my eye as well he was being he was being interviewed on modern actors now this is in the 40s so he had 25 years of experience. And he said, that's what's the matter with actors today. They don't act. <laughs> so, and he made an example. So there was this uh, actor, I don't know what film. There's an actor that uh, was uh, supposedly shot in the arm during a, a World War I scene. And, uh, and he flinched and I uh, got shot. And uh, oh, Edgar was offended by his lack of expression, should I say. <laughs> yes. uh, he said, ah, I got shot in the arm. You'd know it. This guy's <laughs> talking about he got shot in the arm like he ran out of a pack of cigarettes or something. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought it was a pretty good point. Yeah. I mean, they're not feeling it. They're and he got shot in the arm. <laughs> Put me in that place. I'll show you how I what it feels like. <laughs> Brilliant. So, did you get a feel for um, who Edgar Kennedy was? You know, just personally as a as a man. What you know from, from talking to his family. You know, what what was he like off off uh, camera? Oh, gee, he was very kind, generous. He. Uh, let his kids grow. He introduced them to all his favorite sports and uh, with them, camping, hunting. Uh, the kids were, he had a son and daughter about the same, a couple years different. And there was one story where um, they would see their dad uh, carry uh, tobacco. He always had a pipe in his mouth or a cigarette or something, and when camping, he would chew tobacco. And the kids were curious. I said, what is that? And I said, and he said well, it's tobacco. Can we try it? I said, I wouldn't recommend it. So they snuck off and they got it in his bag and they, I said, a couple of green kids, according to you. <laughs> And he stuck. They had to go home. <laughs> well, he taught him. He taught yeah. him. That's brilliant. It reminds me of that scene in Pinocchio 
when he has that big drag on that cigar on um, was it Fun Island, and the, he just goes green from the top. Oh yeah. <laughs> There was a short that Edgar made at RKO called What? No Cigarettes? And uh, and uh, his support star, all, he smoked it to the extreme. He had, we'd smoke a whole pack of cigarettes <laughs> yeah. and, and light the, the plastic outside. And he's so addicted. <laughs> it's so extreme. It made it a punchline. Oh, brilliant. That's great. Um, so what happened to what happened to Edgar in his later career then, uh, Bill? How did he sort of leave? I mean, was, did he work right up to the end, or what? 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 what how did his career? Yes. Pan oh out? yes, he he made a, a character that everyone could relate to. He was the average man. That's how it was billed in his own series that starred for for fifteen, sixteen years for RKO. But his mannerism, the slow burn. Now that's kind of gotten lost over the years, but he was well known for that, where he could uh, take a scene. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, I'm taking off my hat. I'm taking off my glasses. He had quite a bald head, and he would show his exasperation where everything was going wrong for him, <laughs> and he'd yes. blow up, and he'd slam his head, and yeah. and sometimes he'd close out short with that in a close-up right and okay it started off as an accident but he had that mannerism ever since roach but they said hey let's use it as a as a, you know going like out yeah and it's yeah. a real punchline yeah so so did that start at roach the slow burn was that a, a he showed, that time he, yeah he showed uh, frustrations and his his hands were all over his face as he wiping himself. And some of those boyfriends, uh, they, they showed that mannerism. And, uh, but once he was in the average man, and again, that was a, a slow progression evolution of his character, but that one of them by accident or not, they had a close out with him doing the slow burn. And, uh, someone said, Hey, that's it. Make that your <laughs> your identity. So, yeah. so who knows where that came from? Well, that's great. That's really good. Um, so, that, I mean, this might be a difficult question to ask you, Bill. What What do you think is your favorite um, Edgar Kennedy um, short with Laurel and Hardy? Perfect day. Sorry, perfect day. Perfect day. Uncle Ed. <laughs> Very good. Well, am I supposed to say? Uh, something else <laughs> no 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 not at okay. all not at all no I, it's just I, I i think about you know which, which one is my favorite and he is just he's he's just so good in all of them isn't he he's so, so consistently good i mean perfect day is is perfect night owls i mean he really shines in night owls because he really he's got such a big part in that and uh Real, but I, I mean, I think Bacon Grabbers is brilliant. He's really kind of ominous in Bacon Grabbers. Mm. Um, and uh, I mean, for the finishing touch is one of my favourite of the silent shorts, and I think he's brilliant in that as well. So it's re it's just really hard to choose. So there is no right or wrong answer. The finishing touch, yeah, yeah. But as you, you know, as you say, he he was just so dependable, wasn't he? In in all of the films, just like James Finlayson. So he was a very good. Not a replacement, but he was he was good to step into that 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 gap right, right. because he was just so dependable in, in yeah. each performance. The good uh, support. He's a heavy, or he could be a comic. Yeah, that's well rounded. Yeah, yeah, and then, and uh, in an unaccustomed as we are, when when he's uh, he steps into the room and he's he's whistling <laughs> to them and beckoning them to come out. You know, it's just really good, really really funny.
So what I was just going to ask you as well um, is the the atoll question, Bill. Our our, our famous atoll question. So talking about fa- favorite films, um, you are about to be stranded on a deserted atoll, but we are allowing you to have with you four Laurel and Hardy related items. Um, and a bonus item. You get a bonus item. So you can have a Laurel and Hardy silent short, a talkie short, a feature film, a Laurel and Hardy related book, not your own, although it is worth keeping. Um, and your bonus item, you can have any other Edgar Kennedy film. So starting with your Laurel and Hardy silent short, Bill, what are you going to keep? Easy. That's off. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a popular island you're on there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll show it silent. We don't need the sound, so it'll be primitive. I want to if see only. that movie. Hope if I got, only. Hope it's Fantasy yeah. Island. Uh, hope the cat's off with me. That's good. Nobody's come up with that one so far. That's no. a good one. No. It could be rubbish, though. What happens if it's rubbish? You'll think, why did I choose this? <laughs> Well, for my talkie, that's what it's going to be, Rogue Song. So I may as well carry oh, on. Okay. <laughs> okay, what are you, your talkie short then? What is your talkie short? A yeah, Rogue Song. That's not a short, that's a feature. No, that's, oh, maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, the short is Hats Off, the feature is Rogue Song. Okay. Uh, oh, God, no, so, so your silent short is Hats Off. Yes. And then you've got a, then you've got a talkie short as well. Oh, talkie short. Yeah, uh, with with Edgar. No, no, no. It could be anything, anything oh, at all. Uh, well, <sighs> it's a really hard. You this know, is the hardest one, I, isn't it? I, you know, I like help me. Of course, yes. You know, most it. people say music box, but I, I, I really like help me. Yeah, that's such a great ending. If I had any sense, I'd walk out on you. Well, it's a good thing you haven't any sense. It certainly is. It is. You can't. You can't go wrong with helpmates. It is. It's a. In fact, I think helpmates. So far, of all the people I've asked on the show, I think helpmates is probably the one that comes out tops uh, above Music Box. I, I can understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It's a really, really popular one. Um, okay. So and so, Rogue Song is your feature film. I think you'll be disappointed with that, Bill. I think if you get the Rogue Song on your island and you have no other features to watch, <laughs> I suspect that's going to be a my, uh, okay. Well, I got a. Then I'd have to go with Babes in Toyland. Cause oh, okay. Yeah, Babes in Toyland. Oh, Henry Brandon, of course. Of course, your other uh, biography, yes. Big, big catches, big rat. <laughs> yeah, what is it about um, Henry Brandon that took your interest, Bill, just as a little aside? I mean, we may come back onto this in the Babes in Toyland episode in many years to come, because it'll take me forever to get to it. But what, what is it? what was it about Henry Brandon that took your fancy to write about? Well, we... <laughs> Of course, I met him back in 84. I picked him up uh, at a train depot to take him to a tent meeting in San Francisco. Now, I'd already been Grand Sheik of the tent, so it was all arranged, I think, through Stan Laurel's daughter. And uh, I drove him around, and um, I decided to take him for lunch. And it was in Palo Alto, California. It was an old called Dinah's Shack. And uh, it's been around for a long time. I knew that, but what I didn't know was that uh, Henry Brandon went to Stanford University, which was in Palo Alto. And and, uh, so when I pulled into Dinah's Shack, he said, Dinah's Shack, I haven't been here since Stanford. You went to Stanford? (laughs) You went to this restaurant? (laughs) <laughs> we had a great time. He had been there what fifty years? Wow, not more. And and uh, so we had a, a nice bond uh, after that. Right. And um, uh, he he knew I was a, a police officer, and he, he was intrigued about that because sometimes he plays. He's a character actor, so uh, uh, I think he's played police officers before. And uh, I, I'm just not a stereotypical cop, you know. I did my job and and had a lot of uh, fun and spread a lot of humor. And uh, so I, I was a different cat in how actors 
perceive of police officers and the performance of their duty. Now, it's not, you know, high profile stuff all the time. We had a lot of public relations and things like that. So, If you come back here again, I'll arrest you. Who will? Uh, we will. Oh, is that so? So uh, we became friends and... Uh, he would write postcards to me whenever he was out of town and we brought him up for a few of our banquets. And, uh, so we videotaped him and, uh, and he suddenly died in 1990. I just saw him two months before uh, we had him up. And, uh, so it was a, quite a loss. So things were dormant as far as Henry Brandon, people were dropping like flies back then. And it, it wasn't until uh, a few years back now, just a few years ago, that uh, a Native American lady uh, discovered Henry Brandon, one of his uh, Indian rules. And she, she thought he was Native American. Now, she's, now she is focused on that. She could spot a pony a mile away. But uh, she wanted to know more about Henry Brandon and started a Facebook group uh, and for the love of Henry, wanted to know anything about him. She had no idea about Sons of the Desert. And Rick Green, I'm sure you know his name, uh, he told me, hey, this, this gal is starting a hemp book, said we should help her. So we put up the, the beeline for, uh, hey, we all know Henry, let's, let's help out So. Uh, we started bringing up a little uh, anecdote, you know, uh, memories and even donated footage. Well, she wanted to know more. And uh, so she challenged Rick and myself to write a book on him. My God, I don't know. Never interviewed him. We never properly interviewed him. He was a, a, a friend. You don't just sit down and, uh, you know, corner them. So uh, we all did this backwards and, and typical uh, investigative process. You know, we depended on uh, newspapers and maybe what critics had to say and kind of uh, pieced it together. So we have a little bit of both, you know, it's a filmography, biography, and uh, I think it came out really well really well for sons you know especially yeah that's great that's lovely um and what's your what's your sort of favorite scene in babes in toyland bill what's uh what, what's special about that one for you it's a fantasy it's a fantasy and one that uh look forward to every year when they showed it around christmas or thanksgiving time in the united yeah. states and uh, it was a big production, and uh, Stan and Ollie were at their best. Stanny D and Ollie Dumb. <laughs> That's right. Where are you going, Mother Pete? I'm going over to Barnaby's to make a final plea. Surely there must be one spark of kindness in that stony old heart of his. That's a good idea, but I don't think it'll do any good. You're right, Ollie. You can't turn blood into a stone. What do you mean? Huh? What do you mean? Well, her talking to Barnaby is just a matter of pouring one ear into another and coming out the other side. It can't be done. I'm sorry, Bo Peep, that you had to choose me for the best man. Why, I'd rather do anything in this world than to have to give you away. Well, Stan is so upset... He's not even going to the wedding. You are upset, aren't you? Upset? I'm housebroken. Not housebroken. He means heartbroken. Housebroken. Uh. And uh, as an aside, Henry Brandon, whenever he would talk about making Babes in Toyland, he never called the uh, Stan Laurel. He never referred to him as Stan or Stanley. He referred to him in the script. It was Stanny. 
Yeah. And he couldn't get that out of his head. But <laughs> no one ever called him on him. Said, so when Stanley threw everyone in the pool uh, <laughs> between takes, he knew not to throw me in the pool because I was in makeup and took three hours to shut down and remake me. So, so I always got a <laughs> kick out of that. <laughs> That's nice. That's a nice story. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay, that's great. And uh, so your your next choice, Bill, is a book, Laurel and Hardy related. But incidentally, of course, um, Randy Scrapvet is publishing a book all about babes in Toyland, hopefully by the end of the year. Looking forward to that to see if there's anything new. Yeah. We, yeah, we brought really up good. everything we could uh, with the newspapers had to say about it, critics. Uh, there was so much drama going on between Roach and Stan Laurel. Uh, and, and Randy handled a lot of that in his existing book. So I'll be curious to see if there's anything new. Yeah, yeah. I think he's. Uh, I think he said he's focusing on Babes in Toyland sort of more generically. So so from the sort of the, the operetta and... All the all the various versions of it include, but with the main focus on Laurel and Hardy's. But yeah, be a really interesting book. It would be refreshing. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, so, which book would you like to keep with you on your on your deserted atoll, Bill? Mister Laurel and Mister Hardy by Doctor oh, John McCabe. That's a nice choice. That is a very nice choice. Start at the beginning. Yeah. It's an excellent book. Yeah, yeah. Paved like, the way for for many others. Listen, I like here when I read that book. I wanted to skip to where the era I knew Marlon Hardy from the Roach time. But as I got older, I wanted to know about the beginning. And they and uh, McCabe did a good job on uh, working with Stan and Ollie, going back to the beginnings of their careers. Say, was your father and mother's name Laurel? Sure, why? Did you ever have any relatives? Where were you born? I don't know. Fancy not knowing where you were born. Well, I was too young to remember. How do I know where I was born? Didn't you once tell me that you had an uncle? Sure, I've got an uncle. Why? Now we're getting someplace. Is he living? No. He fell through a trap door and broke his neck. Was he building a house? No, they were hanging him. So that's the stuff that intrigues me now as a uh, biographer is uh, how do they get there? You could show a picture of them, say, Bernard Denton. Picture with Vernon with three students, as Vernon Dent, but we like Vernon Dent, but how did he get there? So that's part of the story is going back and what were his baby steps getting in, in, into uh, acting and professional acting in movies and to where he became a cherished uh, support character. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the nice things about. Um, watching Stan and Babe's films is that you can watch that team develop right from its embryonic stage, you know, which is very, very rare, isn't it, to find that on, on uh, you know, on camera. Uh, I mean, you know, it, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of history before before that, but Maybe. just from those, just from those pre, just from the lucky dog onwards, you know, if you watch them in chronological order, seeing that uh, the team develop is just magic. It's brilliant. And that was part of the charm of Sons of the Desert when they started. Uh, no one had access to all the films like they seemingly do now on a different format. So uh, at a convention where you're seeing it for the first time with friends, uh, something with musical uh, accommodation and everyone's laughing because they're all appreciators. And then we see uh, memorabilia and um, it was... Um, sure lured me in. This, that was the type of group I was interested in. I hosted that Edgar Kennedy celebration in Monterey in 1998, but I'd also written quite a few articles in the uh, Entertainment Journal along the way at various different topics. Yeah. And uh, and your last choice you have, Bill, is you can your bonus choice is any other Edgar Kennedy film. 
you can keep one more film with you, any Edgar Kennedy film? Well, uh, I'm going to keep on my, uh, the first comedy for RKO that starred Edgar Kennedy was called uh, Lemon Meringue. Started off the series. And they threw something like uh, 120 pies, this little cafe, Charlie Hall, Instigated it, if you can imagine. Oh. <laughs> but it's lost. No one's Another seen it. Lost one. oh. No one's seen it since it first made the round. So I could take that with me on my fantasy island. I'd like to see <laughs> You are gonna have a very popular island with all these lost <laughs> films on, Bill. <laughs> now a little more seriously for uh for sons. Edgar made these shorts for 15, 16 years, but uh, there's a title I really like called Rough on Rents, 1942. And Charlie Hall, again, is the main antagonist. And he's wearing a zoot suit. <laughs> and uh, Edgar owes him money. So that's what, how the whole thing starts. Edgar chooses a uh, wife and mother-in-law out. so We can rent uh, his apartment out to get 80 bucks to pay Charlie Hall. And it's just wonderful. I think you could get it on YouTube, but it's, it's really a classic. And that's just the shorts because the pictures, uh, Edgar made plenty of those at all the studios. He was a star by then. And uh, um, he made one with uh, John Wayne, where he was for John Wayne called in Old California. Okay. Uh, and uh, we showed that in Sacramento. Uh, when the convention was held there, I think in 2010. And his last feature film was called My Dream is Yours, starring Boris Day. It was her second film, 1948, and it was Edgar's last. So I got to interview Doris Day when I was doing the Edgar Kennedy book. And uh, the, the unique experience for me was that uh, a lot of people go to Doris Day to ask her about her movies. And she was tired of talking about Doris Day, but she loved to talk about Edgar Kennedy. Oh, lovely. She do oh. all about him. And uh, he was very kind to her, and she never forgot. She called him a genius. She said, she said everyone in the business knew that Edgar Kennedy was a genius. That's lovely. So that's coming from Doris Day. That's uh, quite flattering that's indeed. Good. Yeah, so that was her second, only her second film. Only her second. Wow, that's brilliant. And as you say, that will make a big impression. It's all very much like uh, Gene Harlow, of course, was was always very uh, indebted to to Stan and Babe for the the kindness and warmth that they showed to her, when, you know, in her early uh, early oh, yeah, films. Yeah, sir. Yeah, fabulous. And I, I mean, one one thing that really struck me just looking down the list of of people that Edgar worked with oh. over the years. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Laurel and Hardy, the Marx Brothers, W. C. Fields, Eddie Cantor, Harold Lloyd, Clark Gable, Carol Lombard, Jimmy Stewart, um, John Wayne. It's just ridiculous. Ginger Rogers, Lucille Ball. Incredible, absolutely incredible list. I mean, that's just a few of them. Um, yeah, he's he certainly got about. He certainly got about. <laughs> And he died at 58. Can you imagine if he continued yeah, living? Yeah. He could have made it into television easily. Yes. And uh, he could have done what he wanted. But he was only 58 when he died, so that yeah. cut off his career. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there we go. But uh, no, I mean, he's left. A, he certainly left a, a lot of uh, enjoyable films behind for us to, uh, to to laugh at today, and uh, leave them laughing certainly is one of those. Um, and also the Marx Brothers, of course, Duck Soup. I mean, what a great little scene that is as well. Oh yeah, absolutely brilliant. Oh, yes. Hey, what's the idea of fighting in front of my place and driving my customers away? Hey, mister, you got a mistake or someplace. I know fight. You understand that this guy, he's a worker for me. I ask him something, you're not telling me nothing. I ask him why I don't speak. All the time, you don't speak. What do you think he do? He make a fight to go like this. Hey, what's the idea? Oh, that's not my idea. That's his idea. All the time I say something, he don't say nothing. Every time I speak... Will you shut up? Hey, listen, what are you doing around here? Who are you? Hey, can't you see? Can't 
Can't you say anything? No, he not say nothing. Oh, shut up. I am a shut up, but mister, you don't no understand. Look, he's a spy and I'm a spy. He work for me. I want him to find out something, but he don't find out what I want to find out. Now, how am I going to find out what I want to find out if he don't find out what I got to find out? Will you quit annoying me? All right, I quit. All you got to do is to make him stop doing this. <laughs> oh. Now, just for that, I'm going to tear you limb from limb, limb from limb. <laughs> You to kick me. You don't have to teach me. I know how. Oh. Edgar has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, probably because of that. Because of yes. that movie. <laughs> amazing, absolutely amazing. Bill, it's been fantastic to to chat with about Edgar with you today. Thank you so much for uh, for coming on and, and spending time with us. Um, uh, just one final question for you: is, is there any projects that you're currently working on, or anything that you'd like to just uh, promote or give a shout out to or for? I'm always doing research for my own. I'm a, a thirst for knowledge. So if I come across something that I think someone can use, I'll shuttle it out. Uh, I am committed to do a couple more bios, but I, I'm not going to announce it as yet. Right. But it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. And uh, writing articles, I, I'd like to progress. Back to articles, they're a lot easier to do. A book is a big responsibility. Yes. But yes I, this is, is uh, I just completed my fifth, so you, you never know. This is very true, yeah. Well, good luck with any any future publications, uh, Bill. If there's anything that I can do on the on the podcast to help you to promote any of the you know your future titles, do give me a shout. Um, uh, do you have a, um, you know, where can people go to to actually find your books if they want to purchase one? Because, I mean, I would s- certainly recommend the Edgar K- Kennedy book. Um, so do you have a website that they can uh, they can visit? Uh, Amazon is the best. But, right, okay. Yeah, it's Brilliant. been Bill Cacera. Yeah. And Amazon, it should come up. If you want to learn a little bit more about the books themselves or what I'm doing, I have a, a web page just put in uh, BillCacera.com. And it should come up. Brilliant. That's great. Well, what I always do as well, Bill, and I'll, I'll put a, a link in the podcast show notes that, so that anybody listening to this can just go straight to the links and it'll straight, ah. take them straight to straight to your books and they can snap one up because, uh, yeah, absolutely well recommended. Brilliant read. Bill, thank you so much, sir. It's been, uh, it's been wonderful. And hopefully, uh, if you're happy, you'll come on again in, in the future to talk about another, another film or two. I'm at your disposal, Patrick. Thanks for having oh, me steady. on. Be careful. Be careful what you say. Okay. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you so right. much, sir. It's been, it's been great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed our chat with Bill and our little look at Edgar Kennedy. I know I certainly did. Um, if you'd like to pick up a copy of Edgar Kennedy, Master of the Slow Burn by Bill Cassara, you can find a link to it in the show notes as usual. Um, And that about wraps up episode 14. Uh, Normal Business will resume next time as we focus on one of my very favourite silent shorts, The Finishing Touch. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, And all that is left to say is um, thank you as usual to our special guest, Bill Cassara, to the Bohunks Orchestra for the wonderful music, but most especially thank you to you for listening. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.